grace and peace be to you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Our theme for today could be said as, how do you speak about God, or how do you describe God? Our gospel text, Nicodemus came to Jesus with such a question. Our gospel conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus shows to us how human speech fumbles and how it falters. For Nicodemus initially starts out asserting his belief that Jesus must be from God. But then he finds himself struggling with trying to be instructed about what it means to be born. Human speech for us was also recorded in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah, where the prophet's lips were touched by the ember and how it enabled him to speak to the peoples. And how the speech was really a gift of God and not by something attained by human insight. And this act of cleansing was not only to restore the condition of a sinful person, but it also released the power to hear God's speech and then to reflect those words to others. You know, we also had Psalm 29 for today. And if we had space and time in our service, we could go on for four hours, but I'm sure your prayers are answered. That won't happen. But yet I encourage you to read Psalm 29, for in there is beautiful speech about the voice of God. For in that voice you hear about how it thunders over mighty waters, and how it breaks the cedars of Lebanon, and how it flashes forth with flames, and shakes the wilderness, and the oaks are in the world. Such a description of God. And perhaps we've seen descriptions of ourselves or of others. You know, they wear those t-shirts that have all sorts of icons or different letters on them. And thanks for... Maybe that's better. Thanks for my technician back there encouraging me to have better speech or speech that is heard for around the world and here today. And I don't have to shout as much. Thank you so much. But just like we've had our own identity issues, we sometimes see people wearing t-shirts that have different statements. I remember seeing one that showed the picture of a dwarf, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and it said, I'm with Grumpy. Well, maybe, maybe sometimes we just haven't felt like ourselves. Maybe we woke up and something unfortunate happened, or maybe someone said something to us that we couldn't appreciate. Or maybe, you know, it's due to a lack of sleep, or maybe they're our favorite sports team lost. Maybe we're feeling a little salty, right? Or maybe we've said, or maybe we've heard others say to us, right? Today it just doesn't seem like you. Well... What are people? Well, we are people defined by what we do. That is, what we do expresses who we are. And that's the same way with God. You see, we know God by what he does. We can't travel to find God and then look and see what he does and make a report of all the things that define who God is and then file that away or broadcast that to the world. But what we do know is what God does. We know God through his actions, how he reveals himself through scripture and through others and through his means of saving work. And today we have Trinity Sunday, another description, a focus on the love of God. That's agape. And as we celebrate this Trinity Sunday, it's really a trinity of love. So what does that mean? Well, God is three persons of love. You see, Jesus leads Nicodemus through this conversation in our gospel text to see that. There is one God, the Father. There is the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
Nicodemus understands that Jesus comes from God, for he declares, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And later in verse 13, Jesus gives a hint to Nicodemus that he is the Son of God. And the Bible goes on to tell us many examples about who is Jesus and who is the Trinity and who is our one true God. The Old Testament lessons for us tell us that we are to worship the one true God and not to have any other gods before God. And in the New Testament, for example, in John chapter 5, we hear that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. But does that mean both? We're honoring both the Son and the Father separately? That is why God is one. Verse 5 of our text, Jesus explains this description of God as he declares the meaning of the Trinity. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What binds these three persons together is the Spirit of love. John writes so much about how God is love. At the baptism and transfiguration of Jesus, the Father says, This is my Son, whom I love. God, who is the Trinity, is a God of love. Jesus dies on the cross, and we rejoice in that never-changing expression of agape, because God loves us. However, in our post-modernism world, what percentage of people actually believe in our Trinity, in our true God? Some presume to judge using human and reason about spiritual things. But yet, isn't it interesting that at the same time they use this logical reasoning, they can't even understand the nature around them. Hence, some people talk it up to say, well, there must be some existence of a God. But they wouldn't affirm that there's a direction to a true God. Or would they affirm that there are doctrines that God reveals to us? But many people believe that way. They believe that God exists in some way, but not much more. But God is so much more. And we have the chance to tell people about the good news. In the Old Testament, the Israelites confess to the one and only God. And Jesus describes for us today the beautiful passage, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We know this as John 3.16. On this day we give thanks to God for this doctrine of the Holy Trinity, and we are assured that the Trinity is not temporary, but eternal. Jesus was sent by the Father to save the world and us, and the Holy Spirit is part of that. You see, if we look into detail about this, Paul records in his letter to the Romans, chapter 1. The gospel he promised afore through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. He was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. He was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness. By the resurrection from the dead, even Jesus, who is Therefore, according to the flesh, we saw Jesus. He appeared to us. And yet, according to the Spirit, he has existed since eternity. About the Holy Spirit, Christ gives us more information. In John chapter 16, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you to all the truth. Now perhaps it's easier for us to understand the Father and the Son. And perhaps that's why Jesus goes on to explain the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. We see that in Matthew chapter 28. We know this passage as the Great 
Commission. For Jesus sends out his disciples and us, saying to them, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. And how beautiful we'll experience that this morning. Here, divinity by Christ is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. And since, as all good confirmands, we understand and know that we must place our truth and confidence in one true God, that we must also place our trust and confidence in the one who has power over death and hell and the devil and all creatures, and by whose authority he protects us from such, and who saves us and guards us, putting his hedge of protection around us, and how that will suffice, except that we place our confidence in this one true God, absolutely. That now Christ in this passage commands us that we should also believe in the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Well, let's explore this conversation with Nicodemus and Jesus a little more. The Gospel shows us clearly the limitations of reason and free will. For we see it distinctly in Nicodemus, because he was the best of the best, right? The leader, the prince, if you will, of the Pharisees, who were the leaders of religion at that time. However, the limitations of human reason becomes clear. For the longer that Nicodemus talks with Christ, the less he understands about Christ. Very verily I say unto thee, except one be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, this new birth, right? Jesus speaks must be explained. Jesus doesn't abolish natural birth, but he speaks about a birth which is of water and the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Such words cannot be grasped by reason as we try to explain in a logical way what it means to be Spirit, what it means to be water, and how that would look like as some rebirthing. Therefore, Nicodemus asks his question. How can a man be born of water and the wind? Right? Spirit. For indeed, such sources, water and wind, well, that would just create a bunch of bubbles. Can I get an amen? So what is this water and spirit? Such is baptism. The water is baptism. The spirit is the grace that is given to us as a free gift to us in baptism. The result is a new birth, where we step out of the old Adam, we step out of sin, out of death, out of slavery, out of temptation. For those who are born of the flesh, run around the world trying to find all sorts of ways to live. For when you live by the flesh, you are defending yourselves daily. You are struggling to live daily. But those who are born anew through baptism, through living waters, then we declare, I am in God's hands, who preserves me, who protects me, who nourishes me, and so in a wonderful fashion. And we also know with confidence and assurance that he will continue to preserve me and provide for my future. New life, new life is like the wind. How can that be? Well, new life consists not in a dependence upon works, but it abides and perseveres in the grace of God, which he gives to us through Jesus Christ. Consequently, through Christ, there is a new life that has no definition of a beginning or an end. It's like the wind, right? We hear the wind blowing, but we do not know whence it comes from or whether it goes to. Baptism is such a new life. It is the same, because listen, a man preaches the word in his mouth, 
But we do not know how God creates this word. And we do not know how it will be delivered or where it will go or what good works it will create and the fruit in abundance. And listen, Moses set up serpents, serpents of bronze on a pole. We know this as the Nehushtan. 700 years the Israelites carried that around with them. Those, it was an imitation of the fiery serpents that were bothering the Israelites. Now, this Nehushtan was not biting the Israelites or harming them. In fact, it was saving them. And perhaps in a like manner, Christ also took the form and the appearance of a sinner. But yet he becomes my salvation. His death becomes my life. And he atones for my sin and he takes away the wrath of the Father. So what is baptism? Well, it's the water and the spirit and the word together. And that's what happened in the beginning, the creation. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light, water, spirit, word, creation. Likewise, now in a new creation through baptism, the spiritual rebirth of water, of spirit, and of the word. For we know if anyone is in Christ, then he is a new creation. The baptism instituted by Christ is the spiritual rebirth of water, spirit, and the word. And we know from Titus chapter 3, God saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. That is, the washing of regeneration and renewal. That is, washing of water, regeneration, a rebirth of renewal of new life with the Holy Spirit. And finally, just as Jesus invited Nicodemus, so he invites us to receive God's gift. The crucified Son of God shows us God's love. That those who trust Jesus, staking their lives on divine love, will be reborn above from the Holy Spirit. God's mercy, that they will not be merely forgiven, but that they will be made whole, remade in God's image as adopted children into God's family. So wonderful. And that's because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit refuse to be content with a world of flesh bent on its own self-destruction in its futility and senselessness about always trying but always failing. You see, divine action is agape. It's about reaching out to the unlovely. It's about expressing the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. And remember to practice your social witnessing.